Special security <coughs> reporter for the uh, Washington Post, and I'll express a personal opinion. I, I don't think it's a controversial one. I think it's widely shared that Ellen is one of the very most capable, diligent, uh, objective reporters in the country. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the Federalist <coughs> Society for hosting this symposium, and uh, I'd like to just without further ado, uh, launch into our discussion. So, a senior White House official recently quipped that in the wake of 9-11, intelligence agencies were criticized for not knowing enough. And today, they're criticized for knowing too much. Well, what I think we're seeing here is an unprecedented level of public engagement in what is really a kind of national recalibration of the proper scope of government surveillance in the digital age. It's, it's not without acrimony and not without concerns that we are giving away too much to our adversaries, but I think most of it is well-intentioned, and I think it's reflective of a healthy and functioning democracy. And as uh, Vince pointed out, the two distinguished speakers sitting next to me here today have helped shape this important discussion. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to a lively exchange of views in the next hour or so with some time at the end for, uh, for questions. And I'd like to open our discussion with a quote from the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, from a recent interview he gave to the Daily Beast. It was about the uh, Section 215 Telephone Metadata Program, which you all are aware of, I'm sure. Here's his quote. He said, had we been transparent about this program from the outset, right after 9-11, which is the genesis of the 215 program, and said both to the American people and to their elected representatives, we need to cover this gap. We need to make sure this never happens to us again. So here's what we are going to set up, here's how it's going to work, and why we have to do it, and here are the safeguards. We wouldn't have had the problem we had. Now, the intelligence community's position for the past eight months has been that Snowden's disclosure has dealt a blow to national security. Ken Weinstein pointed out that the fact of the existence of the program itself was, was a harm. But now the DNI is saying we should have made the pub public debate the program public before launching. Mike, do you see any contradiction in that? And on a more fundamental level, do you agree with the DNI that our country would have been better off if we had had this debate? I do think there are things that we, we could have, in general terms, discussed that would not have compromised, uh, you know, the essence of the program. Now, you know, the more detailed you get, the more the balance begins to, to tip to a, a compromise. But the general notion, which has now been declassified, that we are um, collecting some large amount of telephone metadata and analyzing it, I don't know in and of itself would have been a, uh, a serious degradation of our, our capability. And it does uh, allow people to have a debate about it. And if they choose not to do that, and if they're willing to accept the consequences, which is reduced <coughs> knowledge, less convenience in other respects, then I think that's all to the good. Now, I think a lot of the stuff that was revealed by Snowden or disclosed by Snowden, first of all, some of it not accurate, but some of it can't be explained as solicitude for the privacy of Americans, but really go to the heart of, of um, activities that we undertake against people who are threats to the United States or who are representing uh, foreign viewpoints that we obviously want to collect intelligence on. So I don't want to suggest that what's been revealed is, is all of minimal significance. But this particular program, I think, could have been discussed in general terms. So is that, that is such sort of the strategic benefits of transparency might outweigh any tactical short-term disadvantage? I, I think that's right. I think actually one of the, the things that, that emerges, not just in this discussion, but more generally, is the fact that sometimes we don't, uh, the people in the intelligence leadership focus enormously on the tactical issues and not enough on the strategic issues. And strategic, by the way, also means the trade-off that's involved in undertaking certain kinds of activities which might have a tactical benefit but might in the long run actually hurt our position. So you could argue 
for example, that with respect to the, the um, Merkel cell phone, you could argue, you know, you might want to have someone say, well, is it really worth the marginal benefit of that collection as against the fact that if it's revealed, it's going to embarrass somebody who has generally been a very faithful friend of the U.S. Now, you might not feel the same way with Putin, <laughs> um, and, that, and that's where the strategic discussion has to be. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask Anthony, uh, DNI Clapper also said that he thought if there had been such a debate about Section 215 back after 9-11, that most Americans probably would have supported it. I don't think it would be of any greater concern to most Americans than fingerprints, he said. What do you think? Do you think most Americans after 9-11 would have supported the program? And, uh, and then going forward, uh, just if you, we can ask all this. Yeah. Uh, you know, this might be one place where I do agree with, uh, with uh, Director Clapper, that I think, lamentably, the American public would have probably agreed to the metadata bulk collection uh, program had we had the conversation with the American people. Remember, the Patriot Act was enacted 31 days after the 9-11 attacks, and they were not vigorously debated in either House of Congress. Uh, and so I think there he might have it right. That doesn't let him off the hook for uh, lying to Congress uh, under oath. Um, it doesn't let him off the hook for not having the strategic discussions <coughs> that Judge Chertoff rightly says. And so let me say first, and let me just back up before I become the pit bull that people expect me to at the Federal Society. Let me say how happy I am to be here. I really am. I'm, I, I get many invitations to speak. Most of them end up on the no pile before I even see them. I always accept the invitation of the Federal Society because I think it's a place where we need to come and speak and where we need to listen as uh, folks at the ACLU. I've spoken at many of your conferences, even in the summer where it's very hot uh, in Washington, but I come. And I especially appreciate being able to talk with Judge Chertoff because uh, it's government officials like he and others who engage us in this debate that makes the debate much more real and lively. There are other government officials who I won't name who are invited to speak with me and regularly decline the opportunity to have me on a podium and I hope to not um, make you regret any decision <laughs> you made, Mike. Uh, I also think it's especially important to have this conversation with the Federal Society because if there is any set of issues that is critical to the concerns as I understand of the Federal Society, it should be these. To talk about small government, mm -hmm. limited government, to talk about the American <coughs> economic interests in the world, those are two issues squarely at the crossroads of the NSA debate. And so I think if there's anything that goes to the very raison d'etre of the Federalist Society, it ought <laughs> to be the question around the NSA debate. And there are no easy answers, and there are no, I have some strong opinions, but there are no real easy answers. And so. I think ultimately, to go to your question, and you can, yeah. I'll, I'll turn it back to you, but whether or not we need a greater debate, yes. Absolutely. Whether or not we would have probably given the government the, the benefit of the doubt in the aftermath of 9-11, lamentably I would say yes. There were many things we gave the government the benefit of the doubt in the aftermath of 9-11. But the absence of a debate th uh, doesn't make these programs any more legitimate. Um, in fact, it undercuts their legitimacy, I would argue. So let me just follow up on your answers. So if we had had that debate after 9-11 and Congress had given the government the authority to do the bulk collection, do you think the ACLU would still have carried out its constitutional challenge to the program? Yes. And, uh -huh. Yes. Uh, in fact, we've been challenging the Patriot Act from the inception. Mm -hmm. We were the only national organization who really spoke out with a couple of others, some of them on this panel, on this program rather. Uh, Kate Martin and the National Center for Security Studies, but we were the lone voices uh, to raise concerns around Section 215, Section 702 of the Patriot Act. Uh, I'll say this. I think we would have had a much more informed debate. Let's talk about metadata. This is one of my greatest um, points of contention, right? Because people say you, metadata is like a fingerprint, right? We've, we've heard the metaphor before. Um, what's your privacy interest in metadata? So let's use a hypothetical for a moment. I'm a lawyer. Uh, you'll read in my bio, in addition to being the first uh, person in my family to graduate from high school, I'm also the first gay director of the ACLU. I've been openly gay since I was a child. Um, so you know I'm 
the gay director of the ACLU. Let's pretend the New York Daily News decides that it's going to have its equivalent of the police blotter, but they're going to call it the telephone blotter. And they're going to publish the phone calls to and from notable individuals, just the metadata. So they pick me, gay director of the ACLU. And they show at 10.15, I get a phone call from the gay men's health crisis that at lasts for five minutes. Then I place a phone call to my sister in Florida that lasts one hour and a half. Then I place a phone call to my physician, Dr. Laura Fisher, MD. And then I place a phone call to my boyfriend that lasts five minutes. What would you surmise would be the content of my communications? If you know that I'm the gay director and the gay men's health crisis is the premier HIV AIDS center in New York, you would guess that I have just learned out that I have seroconverted from being negative to being HIV positive, all from metadata. And if all of that information was published exactly the way I aligned for you in the New York Daily News, just metadata, in which I have no privacy interest, so why would I be upset if they just relayed exactly that set, same set of scenarios that I just outlined for you? Mm -hmm. There is a privacy interest in metadata. Let, you, let, you, let, let, let me inject over here because <coughs> nobody says there's no interest or there's no valuable information to be gained from metadata because if there wasn't, you wouldn't collect it. Let's have a hypothetical where, um, you know, somebody calls um, from a, a Yemeni safe house for Al-Qaeda into a number 10 minutes after an airline blows up and then the person who receives the call makes a call to make an airline reservation. I mean, there'll be content there too. I think the, the, the case law that developed around metadata is that it's a minimal privacy interest because it's not your data. It's similar to, to what someone might observe you do on the street if you walk around openly, um, or what your financial records or credit card records are, which are again are held by third parties, assembled by third parties, and the law is that they're pretty much available on a very minimal showing by the government. Um, a minimal what? Mike. Very minimal showing by the government. In other words, your, your financial records and your credit card records the government can, can obtain and has been able to obtain for decades on essentially virtually no showing. What, what's required is an assistant U.S. attorney, probably 26 years old, <clears throat> opens his or her desk drawer, pulls out a blank grand jury subpoena, fills it out, gives it to an agent, they serve it on the, phone, on the um, uh, credit card company or the financial uh, uh, institution and they get a ton of stuff about you. By the way, IRS collects a huge amount of data about you. Um, so <clears throat> I think the issue is not what's collected but what it's used for. And that goes to your hypothetical well, we talked about. And, and what the scale, the Correct. scale of it. What is well, no, not the scale. The I'm, I'm no. going to argue the scale mm -hmm. is irrelevant. Hmm. No, what I'm going to say is the use is relevant. Let me explain why. Your hypothetical is disturbing because the Daily News puts it out there. But if the data is collected and the Daily News is forbidden to look at it, and therefore they don't publish it, there really isn't much of a compromise of your privacy. Mm. And the program, the 215 program, and the you know almost all but one court that's looked at this has, has uh, upheld it, <clears throat> those programs put very strict limitations on when you can actually pulse the database and how much data you can get without getting to the next level of permission, which would be some kind of a warrant. So I would argue that the issue you raise is really dealt with by constraining analysis and dissemination, not by storage and collection. That would be undercut, Mike, as you know, by the 12 incidents of <coughs> NSA data abuse that they call Lovegate, right? The 12 NSA employees who've queried the database no, I think that was precisely I think that was 702 data. No, actually, wasn't that 12 triple three? I think, I think it was foreigners. Yes, foreigners. Not all, no, 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 no. Actually, when you read the letter in response to not only, not foreigners, uh, you read the response uh, to uh, who was the congressman who requested the, the, the request in writing. Um, 
it, 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 it details the queries of boyfriends and girlfriends, American citizens, queer, so, looking so whether so on so each so other. Yes, it's true people can break the law. And it's also true, for example, with IRS. Peep, and uh, they can be punished, but people can go in and look at your IRS But I records. think the argument we hear, Mike, is so not... Wait, 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 finish, Anthony. Okay. Um, so that they, and it's true, for example, that police, when they're armed, can pull guns out and kill, kill their, their loved ones, and that happens from time to time. And we don't argue from that that it's an unconstitutional to arm police or to have IRS collect your tax uh, information. I, I'm merely responding to, I think, the metaphor you used, that metadata is equivalent to one's fingerprints. Mm -hmm. And the scenario I gave you, I think, rather starkly shows that the metadata on the four phone calls <coughs> or five phone calls that I hypothetically laid out for you would provide you with much greater information on my right to privacy than my fingerprints. Now, let's talk about the database. The farce of there's, there is a proper check and balance if we require judicial review, which was only spelled out by the president a month ago in his speech. It wasn't certainly the practice prior to the speech. You mean judicial review of queries? Of the queries, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, right, when I went to this second-rate law school that charged me a lot of money in student loans, Stanford, <laughs> the Fourth Amendment is a prohibition <coughs> against unreasonable searches and seizures. So if the government seizes my data, not just only because it queries it, but seizes it. That, I think, is contrary to my understanding of the Fourth Amendment. Now, let's talk about other situations where they would seize my data. They could go into my home. I have a big old box in the corner of my bedroom closet that has all of my father's photographs from when he came to this country. They're all black and white photographs. Some of them when he was young, some of them when he was dating my mother, some of them of picnics, they could pick that box up and seize it. Decide not they're going to search it or query it. The government could just come and pick up that box, not open it. Would I consider that to be a contrary search to the Fourth Amendment? Let's say they don't even look inside the box. They have no idea what's inside the box. They just say, we're just taking Romero's cardboard box in the back of his closet and we're just going to take it from him. We're going to let you know if we need it because it might be relevant to a terrorist investigation. We'll get back to you. And I think part of what we have to ask ourselves, these hypotheticals, is just to see what our comfort zone is. Now, you might say that's different. Let me give you another example, right? Time Warner. I have the, I have the, I have the fantastic package with Time Warner. Right? I'd, I'd like to use hypotheticals because we always use the hypotheticals of the Yemeni calling in America and you know, and the doomsday scenario. But let's say I have the gold package of Time Warner and I want to have everything I want with no commercials whenever I want to because I travel so much. I want to watch Downtown Abbey whenever I want to. And as part of the quid pro quo is that my cable box records me in my home. What I'm doing in front of the TV set, whether I eat popcorn, whether I don't eat popcorn, whether I fast forward through the ads, whether I'm multitasking, doing my emails. And they're, take, and they're feeding that video read of me back into Time Warner. And it helps them figure out what do the viewers actually view on cable television. And let's say the government let itself into Time Warner's video reel and stockpiled all the video footage of me in my boxer shorts watching television and said, we're not invading your privacy. Unless we query your viewing habits, Romero, we're not invading your privacy. How would I feel? in that situation. Now, that's, you, you've conflated about nine <laughs> different sets of issues, um, which is one of the, the challenges in this area, is the tendency to let well, then make one it real. particular issue bleed into others. I mean, the idea that, mm -hmm. you know, someone is videoing you in your house, and that's being helped by Tom, Time Warner. Let's uh, just stipulate that, that that raises issues not dealt with with, with simply the telephone metadata. No, I, that's so, exactly so, right. That's the so, database. So to, that's to, that's the you know. Gotta let someone else talk. Yeah. That's part of the first amendment. I know. I just want to make sure you don't contort my um, hypothetical. So I've been on many a panel with you, Michael. I, I, I think if if you if you look at the metadata in the question in the program we're talking about, which is the telephone numbers, again the seizure of that data, and it's been it's been decided since Smith versus Maryland, is considered to be it's considered to be of such minimal privacy 
that it, it does not require a warrant. It's a very minimal showing in order to collect and seize that data. So that's been what the law has been without the Republic crumbling for at least almost half a century, probably longer than that. Now, I want to come to Ellen's point, because the argument here that was made was it's bulk. Right. And that changes it. <clears throat> but and how the, could the, right, but the, courts, the whole database <clears throat> be relevant? Right, well, so let me unpack both of those. Okay. The courts that have looked at this, with one exception, have made the point that the reason that the scale of collection across large numbers of individuals doesn't change the analysis is because your privacy rights are personal to you. If my privacy is invaded, I've got to make the case based on the data about me that's taken. The fact the data about you is taken, I don't have standing to complain about that. If the data of everybody in the room is taken, I don't have standing to complain about that. Again, I mean, this is not, you could argue that the standing rules ought to change, but you know, I, I, they've been in effect for 30, 40, 50 years at least, and they're, they're well settled. So I don't think the bulk element of this changes it very much. Now, what about the relevance? Anytime you want to check to see, I want to get you know specific here. Anytime you want to check to see whether a call has been made from, let's say, a location overseas to someplace in the U.S., you're going to have to look at all the data. <clears throat> to say something is relevant doesn't mean every piece of data in the set is relevant. It means the category is relevant. And when I was prosecuting cases, like corruption cases or bank fraud cases, we'd subpoena huge amounts of financial records. Now, not all of those records were signs of criminality, but if in the list of financial transactions there was something that correlated to a bribe, that meant that that was a relevant search. In the case of, of the um, metadata, what you want to know is, uh, as somebody said in the last panel, is there an accomplice that, accomplice that Zazi had in the U.S. that we need to take a look at by looking at the fact that there was a telephone call there? Or, as important, in the bombing case in, in, in Boston or in the case we had in August 2006 with respect to the airline plot, are there connections between overseas terrorism and American terrorism? That changes the dynamic. And oftentimes people ask the wrong question. The, the, the question is, it's, it's a question out of the movies. Did this program stop a terrorist who was about to light the bomb? That's great TV. It's not real life. More often than not, what the program does is this. It means if we have a plot like we had in August 2006, and we, we know that there are um, 10 to 12 airliners that are uh, intended to be blown up, leaving Heathrow and coming to North America, and we want to know, right before we bring that case down, whether there are Americans in the U.S. going to do the same thing, we better be 100% sure that there's no connection between the terrorists in London and the folks in the United States. Because we can check programs to see if there are connections, we can be pretty close to 100% sure, and we don't have to stop the US aviation system. If we didn't have that capability, then we'd have to say to ourselves, maybe we need to shut down the US air system for four or five days until we satisfy ourselves that there aren't going to be bombs going off in planes leaving US airports. So that's a, a very concrete example of how a program like this is relevant and in fact compelling. Okay, and yet at the same time, President Obama has announced or d directed that his Attorney General and DNI come up with options for ways to end the program as it currently exists, right? so that the government will not hold the, the data any longer. The problem is he didn't <coughs> specify what the alternative should should be, what it should look like. Should the phone companies hold the data? Should a third party hold the data? Should we just go back to status quo ante, where you need a, a court order with a, a phone number to, to pull on the data from a phone company? Mike, given the uh, sort of technological and political and uh, uh, legal complications, what do you think is the most feasible alternative? You know, I, I think a lot of this will turn out to be an engineering problem. Um, and I, it does, you know, if there's a way to allow the data to be held <clears throat> in private hands, where it is now, and not, and then when you need to pulse the data to be able to operate across different databases, 
you know, if there's no if there's no significant degradation of capability, that's fine. Maybe that assures people uh, that their data is not in government hands, uh, and that makes them feel better. I might note parenthetically that, and that doesn't get to the question of what the private company does with the data, where, who they sell it to, <clears throat> whether they get hacked into, whether misbehavior by people in those companies results in things being leaked. I mean, the idea that to hear the ASA, you say corporate America is trustworthy, the government is not, is a little bit startling. But I think if you can, if you can get by the engineering problem, I don't see a difficulty at, in having the data stored in private hands. Your and condescension is sometimes so startling, Mike. I have to say, I think you're a wonderful man, but um, I don't think I ever said that corporate America is trustworthy and government is not. So perhaps you let me speak for myself. Um, I will say, government only has, only government has the power to arrest us and <coughs> seize our assets. Google cannot throw me in jail. Google cannot freeze my bank accounts. Google cannot do anything in terms of my life and liberties. They may shut me off of their Gmail access, but my life as an American citizen with all the rights that I've become accustomed to can only be taken away from me by the government. That's why the government troubles me much more than the private sector collecting collecting this data. Mm -hmm. Now suppose, Anthony, the government and Congress told you that they cannot carry out this program, a minimally effective program, without aggregating the data in some way. What safeguards would make you feel comfortable that the data are not being abused? Well, I think we're beginning there. I mean, we're having a public debate. Mm -hmm. It's ironic that everyone now, including Mr. Clapper and even the President, uh, laud this great debate that we need to have, but we forget, the, we forget the whole trajectory of this debate. The whole NSA program was done in secret. Uh, it was only when the New York Times was backed into a corner and then published it in 2005, backed into a corner because one of their reporters was going to publish a book and so they decided to put it on the front page of their newspaper. They sat on it for way too long. Not your paper, Alan. Uh, then, after we all found out that the NSA up program was operating in secret, <coughs> Congress passed a law to make it legal. It's done after the fact. Let's remember this. And then, only now are we having the debates with the revelations of Edward Snowden. I think Edward Snowden has done us a service. I know this will get Mike's... Uh, uh, this, now you can really rail at me on something I did say. Um, I think he's done this government a service. Uh, I think he's raised a de a, an issue of critical importance. Uh, I don't think this issue would have been raised or broached but for his revelations. Uh, when I have discussions with individuals saying he should have stayed and faced the music, he should have raised it through the proper channels, those of you in government who were former prosecutors, I've asked uh, a very no notable uh, former prosecutor to lay out for me precisely how he would have revealed this information and stayed in America. Walk me through who he would have called, what protections he was entitled to, what laws he could have invoked to keep him from being locked in jail right away. As I read the law, the Espionage 1917, the Whistleblower Protection Act, he's got no harbor, no legal harbor. So I think he did the one thing he could do. He raised the issue, he left the country, uh, I think he's been very surgical in the revelations. I am not, I actually do not believe that the revelations of Angela Merkel have jeopardized national security the way I see it. I'm not in government, but I'm an American citizen. I actually studied international relations. Uh, I think it's embarrassing. I think it's created friction with one of our allies. I think embarrassment is not the definition of uh, a, a, a kind of bre breaching national security. Um, so I really want folks to tell me how this debate would have happened but for Edward Snowden. I think he's done us a great service. And Mr. Clapper now talks about the importance of a debate, and the President talks about the importance of vigorous debate. That debate was completely not happening prior to the revelations of Edward Snowden. You've raised several good issues that I want to put to, to Mike. Um, one is sort of the forcing function that the, the Snowden disclosure served in prompting this debate. Do, do you think, going forward, we can have more fulsome disclosure and transparency without 
uh, you know, another insider leak. That's one. And then two, how do you think history will, will judge, ultimately judge Edward Snowden? And three, would there have been a way for someone like Snowden to come forward through legal cha uh, channels and make his disclosures without being charged under the Espionage Act? Well, you know, I, I do think that, um, as I said earlier, I think that you could um, declassify some of the things that have been classified. And I think that much of what has been put out now by the government in terms of the opinions, the legal foundation strikes me that with some <clears throat> um, editing, uh, that could be out there and you could have a discussion about these things without seriously compromising uh, sources and methods. So I do think that that discussion ought to continue. And I think sometimes, frankly, the intelligence community should consider the strategic value that you get in getting that kind of buy-in. Um, as far as, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how history is going to judge. I mean, I, the irony of going to that pantheon of civil liberties, Putin's Russia. There was no other uh, choice. It's really uh, fascinating. Um, as is the fact, again, I'm not going to get specific, but if you look at a lot of what has been put out there, it's hard to argue that what he's putting out there are things that are focused on privacy rights. For example, there was a story he put out, which the Norwegians then subsequently corrected, saying that Norway, uh, that we were collecting on Norwegian citizens, for the, and there was one which the uh, former Minister of Interior of Germany corrected, saying that we were collecting on German citizens, just generally. Turned out in both cases, the Norwegians and the Germans said no. These programs are designed to collect calls from the combat zones, like Afghanistan, into Germany, into Norway. A very, very different issue. Now, maybe Snowden believes you shouldn't collect on Afghanistan, where we are at war. Maybe we should apologize to the Germans for having stolen the Enigma codes in World War II, because that was a violation of German law. It's hard for me to see those revelations as someone who's motivated to deal with a, a, a grievance based on privacy. But, I, you know, I think that's really a footnote. The, to me, the main issue is, what are the, the trade-offs we want to make going forward to protect our security? And I will give you an anecdote that has always stuck with me, uh, because I think in many ways it goes to the heart of this debate. When I was in office, the ACLU, among others, were very critical about the no-fly list. Oh, there are millions of people on it, it's terrible, it's unfair, etc. So finally, we declassified the number of people on the list. It was a relatively small number, a few thousand, and the number of individuals, most of them were, were, were foreigners, very few uh, Americans. Um, so we, we put that out, it was out there, and there was still criticism that that number was too many. You'll remember in December of 2009, by then I was out of office, uh, there was the underwear bomber who got on a plane in, in Nigeria, then went to Rotterdam, switched and got on the plane that the U.S. was not on the no-fly list, and happily he was not able to detonate his, his bomb. The very next day, I happened to be at an embassy party, and a, a U.S. senator, who I will not name, who had been a vociferous objector to the no-fly program, comes up to me and says, I don't understand why you guys don't have more people on the no-fly list. In many ways, that captures the problem. Everybody says to the intelligence community, don't do this, don't do that, and they know that when something is missed, the very next day they'll be asked why you didn't do something. So here's my argument. Wherever we want to draw the line, uh, we should draw it. But the members of Congress, if they want to dial it back, should all be on record, not I was in the bathroom during the vote or I didn't have the staff with me, and they should say, I accept that I'm increasing the risk, I think it's worth it, and you know, that's a fair argument. And if something bad happens, I'm prepared to stand up and say I'm accountable for that. I think without that, you're telling people in the community to go out and put themselves at risk without having their back. I, I agree with that. Um, I think our members of Congress are not doing their jobs to educate the American people. I think, I find it startling that no one in our government will take it upon herself or himself to tell the American people that it is inevitable <coughs> that we will be attacked someday. The inevitability of the next terrorist attack is something of which we should all be sure. There's no way you're going to tell, uh, if you want to live in a democracy, P.S. The Brits don't believe that they'll ever not suffer a terrorist attack. 
the Spanish don't believe if you have if you travel in the Basque province. Certainly the Israelis don't believe that they will ever be inured from another terrorist attack. And yet we live in this farce in America thinking that we will prevent all and every the next terrorist attack. And that fantasy that none of our government officials has the courage to say to the American people, we can't protect you 100%. But let's talk about what we can do within what bounds. Because if it's zero tolerance for terrorism attacks, then you're going to give up all your civil liberties. Sure. Now, well, I agree with that. I told you, you're completely right about that, Anthony. I think that, that and so um, I, don't, I don't put my stock in Congress. So, so there's one legal doctrine I think I would love to get your p viewpoint. I've been throwing this out here. So I, I happen to have met Edward Snowden. I spent a day with him in Moscow. Um, uh, 30 years old. I don't know him any more than spent seven hours with him, a couple of meals. I'm willing to bet I've met lots of people. Uh, I've met, we have many clients, some of whom I don't really like. We represent Fred Phelps from the Westboro Baptist Ch uh, Church, the one who organizes the military protests, saying that the reason why the soldiers are dying is because gay people like me are given their rights. We represented Larry Craig in his white stance defense. We've sent to, represented Rush Limbaugh in the hydrocodone medical privacy case. I have many clients, mo most of whom I meet, many of whom I don't like frankly, but I believe there's a principle in place. Ed Snowden I happen to like. I happen, you may dismiss me as a 48-year-old naive uh, up, uh, idealist, the crazy fellow at the ACLU um, who somehow hoodwinked these Ivy League schools from giving him these degrees he was not entitled to. But I happen to think he's a really smart guy. I happen to believe he was motivated by the right interests. I will be glad to eat my words if they can show proof that he is a double agent in Russia. I don't believe that's the case. Um, let's just say there are some aspects of our interaction I would not have had to engage with if he had been working for the Russians. There were things I had to do for him that if he were working on the Russian dime, I, he, maybe then he's a great actor. Be that as it may, Russia is the only place that's taken him in because of Putin. I don't see many of our other allies extending the hypocrisy of the Germans and Brazilians who bellyache about the, pr the privacy violations, and yet I don't see them extending the doormat to Mr. Snowden. So this is my, so I've, I think he's the real deal. I'm willing to vouch my personal gut that I actually think he's motivated by the right values. I think he's one of us, me. Okay. All right? You. Then I will say this, on the policy issues. Mm -hmm. For the, if, and, and when I asked him about this around section, our Clapper case in the Supreme Court, if we had a policy where when we sued the government on using uh, the, ACLU, the ACLU versus, uh, well, Clapper versus Amnesty, 702, right, where we're dealing with the interception of foreign uh, emails, we could improve that we had standing, even though all of our lawyers on the case are lawyers representing Guantanamo high-value detainees interacting with their families in war zones, right? So our lawyers are representing the family of Mr. Halid Sheikh Mohammed and are in touch with his brother-in-law and his wife. Now, if they're not trying to intercept those types of emails, then what are they trying to intercept? And we could not prove that we had standing. The government says, you have no proof of standing, so you can't bring this case. We had no proof of standing, even though we pretty much knew we had standing. The Supreme Court, five of them thought we didn't have proof of standing, four of them thought we had standing. Ed Snowden reveals his first document, gives his standing, boom. On the 215 case. On the 215 case. Very first document, the Verizon order gives his standing. It's the very first lawsuit in 12 years that we actually have legal standing to bring the case on the merits. First standing lawsuit. So now, I'm if you actually... Ask a question, so go ahead. Had the Supreme Court heard your case six months later, i.e. after the Snowden disclosures, I don't know. do you think that yeah. would have changed the outcome? Possibly, possibly. But why not, adapt, why not adopt a principle that we find in criminal law, mm -hmm. where prosecutors, when they find exculpatory evidence, are required to turn it over to the defense team? If a prosecutor sees that the DNA test doesn't match with the, with the alleged uh, perpetrator, they have to turn it over to the defense team. Why not in the context of national security cases where I can't prove standing because I don't have access to the database? If I bring a legitimate lawsuit in federal court and I allege that I think I have standing, why not have the burden of proof shift to the government? Well, they'll have to show 
that I don't have standing or grant me standing so I can go forward with the case. So you don't build in the incentive for a whistleblower to give me standing. Because ultimately, that's the only way we've gotten standing in these cases, Mike. Well, I, 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 again, I, I'm surprised if Snow's motivation was to create standing for the ACLU litigation. His sister's a lawyer. But um, well, I don't, you don't want to incriminate her and I said, be careful. Um, you know, and, and the rules of standing are complicated, and many of them are constitutional, so if we're going to abide by the Constitution, we have to abide by, by those rules. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're asking the question, how do you get judicial review of programs? Again, and, and I, I think the FISA court's gotten a bad rap on this. Um, the FISA court does supervise, you know, the, what part of what was declassified, and I think frankly, would have been helpful had it been declassified earlier were opinions, including opinions by judges where they pushed back pretty hard on the government. You know, one of the, the um, I think unfair arguments that was made is the courts are rubber stamp because they never say no mm -hmm. to a request. But anybody who's been a prosecutor, who's been before a judge um, seeking a warrant knows a judge never says no. They say this is inadequate, you better come back with something more. And that you either have it or you don't have it. But it, it's not an up or down verdict like, like with a jury. So I, uh, I do think you get a lot of oversight in that respect. You get a lot of oversight from Congress. I mean, Congress was fully briefed on these programs. Now some members of Congress say, well, they, you know, they didn't go to the briefing or the staff wasn't there, but I don't think that's an, an adequate response. I agree. So if you want, if you want to tweak the issue of standing, um, I mean, you, you could raise that as an issue, but I don't think that it in any way justifies <clears throat> what Snowden did. Look, let me give you two examples of people who would argue that what they did was motivated by good intent, but I don't think anybody would have a doubt that they're traitors or criminals. One was Klaus Fuchs, who stole the atomic bomb for the, so for the Soviet Union. He did it because he believed that a world in which the US and Britain had the bomb and the Soviet Union didn't would be a dangerous world. And therefore, um, he wanted to even the playing field. I don't think anybody thinks Fuchs sh should have gotten a, a medal instead of, of, of being prosecuted. The second is the individual who's been identified as having been responsible for the anthrax attacks. The theory behind, now he committed suicide, but the theory behind those attacks was that they were designed to raise awareness of some of the risks of bioterrorism. Of course, to do that, he killed a few people. Now, if in fact that was his motive, does that excuse killing people with anthrax because he was trying to uh, alert the government to the fact that there's a vulnerability? I think not. So um, I find the motivational justification inadequate to defend what I think is, is you know, wholesale putting out of information, some of, which act, some of which is accurate, some of which is inaccurate, but which is designed to imp impede a whole host of government intelligence collection programs. Do you think the fact that he actually, he handed the material to a number, a select number of journalists and directed them to use their editorial judgment in terms of what they think should be released or not, counts in his favor at all? Well, I don't know that they have exercised judgment because there's been a lot of threatening. There's been a lot of, I've got a treasure trove, and if you mistreat me, I'm going to dump it all out there. That's actually extortion. That's not being careful with what you release. So I, I'm, I'm counting me in the skeptic category on, on that issue. Some of the journalists, I think, have been careful. Others, not so much. Well, thank I you. Think you know, I think ultimately, for me, the, the NSA debate and the Snowden debate has much more to do with the future of the internet and how we think about this good. Um, maybe I'm getting a little too philosophical. Um, but I think ultimately what you find is the internet under the greatest uh, challenge, attack in its lifetime, right? You have the Germans who are now saying that they need to create their own version of the World Wide Web. You have the American corporations whose interests are now being jeopardized by the fact that they're looking like they're in the back pocket of the American government and less global in their do no harm um, role. I think you have a whole generation of very young people, of which I would put Mr. Snowden in that category, not so young, but young, 29 years old, 30 years old, who don't imagine a world without the World Wide Web and see the World Wide Web and its great potential for being the great equalizer, the great information source for all people on all information, 
the power of the people now being usurped by the governments. I, I would, let me just finish, and I'll, uh, I promise uh, I'll be quick. I think, actually, this younger generation of activists, which are not like me, I'm 49, I'm almost 50, uh, they see their patriotism is to the World Wide Web first and to any government second. And I think any government that gets in the way of the power of the World Wide Web, it's a whole different dissident movement that will do what it needs to, to, to retain the power of the World Wide Web to do that which it's meant to do. And I think those of us who care about the rule of law and human rights and business and small and limited government need to think afresh about whether or not there's something we ought to learn from them. Because I don't think they're wrong. I think it's a very different economic world out here. I think the Jeff Bezos of the world, the, the Bill Gates, their biggest challenge to their business model has been the NSA program. Corp international corporate lawyers, who would hire an international corporate lawyer in Washington, D.C. to represent a foreign government in trade talks if we now know, as we do know, that the Australians could possibly intercept the, com the email communications between attorneys and clients, uh, the Indonesian government and this firm in Washington, and provide that information to the U.S. government in commerce talks with uh, the U.S. government. See, I, 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 I think it, all of that challenges us really fundamentally, and it's not just about the law, it's really a philosophical discussion about the world, its connection, mm -hmm. its relationship, and the World Wide Web. Well, I think you, you, know, you raise a, what is a really interesting question, frankly one that goes much deeper than the NSA thing, and I, yeah. this is going to tee up for a different discussion. I think if you strip away a lot of, the, particularly on the commercial side, a lot of what the debate is about, it really is not about spying. It's about whether global organizations are obliged to submit to the rule of law in individual countries. So much of the issue about where the data is held, which is what the Germans and the Brazilians have raised about the U.S., isn't really about whether the, you know, having the data in the U.S. makes it easier for NSA technically to get the data, because I don't know that that's true. Mm -hmm. It's about whether if there is a court order uh, from a U.S. court requiring the data to be turned over, that data should be turned over. Now, actually, I would argue that really is fundamental to the rule of law. If, if a U.S. court under the strictest rules of getting a warrant says, I need to get this information because, you know, there's a kidna there's a child trafficking group and they're kidnapping nine-year-olds. And an international um, uh, data company says, we don't want to turn that data over because it should be supranational. I think that does pose a fundamental issue. It's not obvious to me that the civil liberties favoring outcome is the one that favors the internet. What I do think is it's enormously complicated, and I would leave you with this thought. If you are a civil liberties person, I consider myself to be one, you worry about all large institutions and a world in which we've radically shifted the balance so the government has very weak power and global inter institutions with no responsibility other than profit making have all the power, I'm not sure that's not a troubling outcome. Fascinating now. I'd, I'd like to have a few questions from the audience. Um, we've got maybe about 10 minutes left, and we can go. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Helen Anderson. Uh, I have been under uh, illegal satellite surveillance most of my life. Uh, I am 75 years old. Uh, will the ACLU take my case? <laughs> we uh, can't make that decision with you right now, ma'am. I'm sorry. We can certainly talk and we can make sure someone takes a look at your case. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mike Doherty, um, President of LabMD, a member of the Federal Society. I'd just like to say I agree with all of you 100%. <laughs> <laughs> And that is sort of the root of the problem. I think um, in the public, one of the biggest issues is credibility and trust. I mean, I don't think everyone in the NSA, I think most people are so well-intentioned as Americans. And I think the ACLU is so well-intentioned as Americans. But the accountability to those that fall off is, I think, critical to our success on both sides. What do you think about how we're going to hold people that break off our privacy rights? Because right now, I think what the public is hearing when our rights are violated from the government is, oh well, and that the NSA just wants it all. And so how do we hold accountability, get credibility, get trust back 
with our government uh, bodies. Well, I do think that's, a, that's a, an important point. Now, I know, for example, in the tax area, you know, there are criminal penalties uh, misusing tax information. Uh, the Privacy Act makes it, I think, a criminal offense to misuse private data. Uh, from what I read in the paper, I think that the individuals involved in misusing uh, the NSA data for their romantic um, partners were disciplined. And by the way, it's not uncommon, frankly, to have cops no, uh, sure. or people in DMVs run license plates improperly because they see a cute girl on the road and they want to you know, get her name and address, and those people ought to be punished too. So I, th I think as a general proposition, we ought to punish people who misuse that. And I'd go further, I'd say, just as I think it was probably a good idea to release the number of requests that the companies were getting from the government for data, and I thought it was kind of a mistake to fight that, maybe there should be an annual report that says, you know, X number of people, without naming them, have committed some violation with respect to privacy, and they've been punished in the following way, and maybe you have more detail for the Inspector General or or for Congress. So I think you ought to um, be, be um, accountable for it, and there ought to be some report at a general level on that. Uh, I'm Nick Rostow. I have uh, actually two comments, um, three, because I also agree with all, everything you all have said. Uh, one is I once knew an East German spy. And so, uh, and he worked for the Atlantic Council of the United States. He was a consultant to the Defense Department, and ever since, when asked by the FBI to vouch for someone's trustworthiness, I always say, I only know what I know. Uh, and will not go further. Second, um, I know a lot of veterans of the Bush administration. I'm a veteran, but I'm not one of them who um, would have been happy with the result on September 12, 2001, that 10 years later there would not have been a second 9-11 uh, scale terrorist attack in the United States uh, in exchange for which uh, the administration lost a lot of court cases. I don't, you both seem to me to be in some way saying, well, it's all right to break the law if the consequences are okay. And that's why I agree with both of you on the imperative of drawing the line and, uh, and having an open debate. I do not share Mr. Romero's what I regard as sentimental view, Mr. Snowden. It's not sentimental, I want to be clear. I, first, I, I only know what I know. Um, I'm, <laughs> you're certainly entitled to your opinion, I appreciate that. Um, I only know what I know. Um, I only know what I've read. Um, I only know that in my opinion there's no revelation that I've seen that is tied to him that I think is jeopardized national security. Now, I also will proffer this. How do you know there's no more Edward Snowdens out there? <coughs> do you know that? I think the NSA is populated with a whole bunch of very young technologists who you might want to spend some time with, who believe in this tool. And they are hell-bent on the importance of the World Wide Web. And so I don't think Edward Snowden is that unique a person to come through the NSA. I don't know if there are others. I've not met any others. I would be willing to bet money that there are others who feel like he does and feel like, way we're going too far here. The government's using the Internet in ways that we ought not to rein it in, uh, that we need to rein it in. I didn't say it was okay to break the law. I don't think it's okay to break the law. I don't think it's okay to lie to Congress under oath. I don't think it's okay to, to hide programs from the public. I don't think the Bush administration has lost its c cases. They won all the cases against me. Uh, this is the first time I actually have a case withstanding in the federal courts. First time. Not lack of trying. Uh, the only reason why we have standing is because Mr. Snowden gave us a document that gave me standing the very next day. So I actually have, you want a system of checks and balances? It's finally working in my case because I have a document leaked to us that gave me standing for the very first time since 2001, which I never had before. So now we're arguing the merits of the case. Do you have a proper Fourth Amendment protection on metadata? Do you have proper f uh, 
Fifth Amendment due process protections. First time these issues have been briefed in a court. Before this, it was always, do you have standing or don't you have standing? I'm finally talking about the con law I studied in law school. And that is all coming as a result of Mr. Snowden's revelations. Now, if you think it's serendipity, that's fine. I actually, I'm, I'm grateful I finally have a constitutional law case that allows me to raise the constitutional questions directly with a federal court. Uh, and so now we're having a real legal conversation in front of an Article Three judge for the first time in 12 years. And I can give you the docket, because we've been, I've been toiling in this vineyard since September 4, 2001 was my first day on the job. I've been on this job ever since the first week of the, before 9-11. So I haven't won the cases before now. Um, I'm hoping to win the one, finally, uh, with a little help from our friends. No, I mean, I, th I think that, uh, you know, there's some embedded within this uh, discussion, I think there are actually some deeper and more complicated issues involving not so much NSA, but really the question, as I said earlier, about, uh, you know, what are the roles of, de of um, domestic laws or, or national laws in a global world? Does everybody get to pick their own rules and their own laws? To what extent, for example, do people, when they don't like what you say on the internet, get to attack you over the internet. I don't mean just criticize you. I mean, you know, try to take down your website or get into your data, you know, doxing. Is that a civil liberties move? Would we allow people in the physical world if they disagree with you to go into your house and burn it down? So, I mean, I think the morality and the law and the culture around the internet are, I mean, this has peeled back one part of that. I think in many ways there are a lot more parts to this. And my own view is actually a lot of the a controversy that this has generated is largely based on tapping into some deeper feelings mm -hmm. people have about how do you deal in a, in a connected world. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right there. And uh, I think this has been a quite a, a good and, uh, and uh, relevant and lively exchange of views and, and one in which there's been a lot of, sort of mutual respect and some common ground. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks, thanks for doing it.